place where they both meet. We have the audience and participants for each other. These natural practices and starting practices, cultural practices. Examples of women sharing what it is they need to share and how you do that. There's no way you can ignore that feelings anymore. We're from all around the world to encompass and talk about what time is it now? Can you help? Started out about different people and about different things. A whole sea of phenomena. Theater for everybody, yes, everybody. That's it, that's it, that's it. And in my understanding of life, relationships, death, I've already been. Welcome to the Siegel Theater Center and the Penwood Voices International Play Festival. My name is Antje Oebel. I'm the co-curator of the Play Festival. You're about to see Almost Equal to a new play by Jonas Hassan Kimuri, translated by Rachel Wilson Poils. Both of them are here, directed by Dan Rothenberg. Um, following the reading, there will be a discussion which with Mod uh, um, uh, translator, playwright, and director, moderated by Kate Lowald, the artistic director of the play company, who has produced two of Jonas's plays in the past. Um, before we start with the reading, I would like to thank the Swedish Arts Council for their support. And um, don't forget to turn off your cell phones and enjoy the reading. is not boring, right? It's not soulless, it's not a bunch of dry theories and graphs. In fact, it's the opposite. The history of economics is full of scattered brains and free thinkers, geniuses and madmen, theorists who smothered, who smothered, so smothered by the ages they lived in that they felt compelled to use their knowledge to create viable alternative worlds, worlds that still shimmer and fill those of us who are left behind with hope and courage. For example, Kasparis Van Houten. Now, the year is 1828. Kasparis Van Houten, in Amsterdam, just has just patented the hydraulic press that will revolutionize the production of cocoa powder. Oh. Oh. Um, the year, uh, Van Houten makes a fortune. He becomes one of Europe's most renowned producers of chocolate, but, at the end of the pinnacle of his career, he decides to take a step back. Why? Researchers have scoured his diaries for clues. In March of 1841, he writes, I have been afflicted by an emptiness I cannot bring myself out of it. In August of 1841, I missed the days when I had an appetite for life. In February of 1842, Everything seems so empty. Is this really all there is to, to life? That's what he wrote, word for word. Two, two, life. <laughs> An accidental repetition. Now, what happened to Casparis Van Houten? Some people claim that he had been struck by what we would call depression today. Huh? Melancholy. <laughs> Hogwash. Other researchers have put forth the theory that he was sexually frustrated. 
<laughs> there are even those who claim that Van Houten, at the height of his career, was seized by the fear of Mammona, the goddess of wealth and the market. What? As if I would believe in such a superstition. Mammona. The name comes from the Latin word mammon, riches, belongings, and it also means someone, something to be trusted. Or do I look like a mystic? What we do know is that Van, is that Caspers Van Houten sold his operation in September of 1842. At a loss to my incompetent son. He returned to the university and spent the rest of his life deepening his knowledge in four subjects. Economics, jurisprudence, the growth habits of small plants, and the main cause of dust. Three weeks before his death, he formulated the economic hypothesis that would become, that would come to be called Van Houten's Theorem. Uh, I'm a attempt to understand and quantify an experience. Let's look at a practical example. Right. The year is 2016. 50 people decide to invest $10 in the hope of having an unforgettable experience. So 50 people times $10 equals $500. Thus, Van Houten's theorem teaches us in all its Simplicity that the collective goal of this investment is to compute is to procure entertainment worth at least five hundred dollars. Let us call this value UX or the expected user experience. Or in modern terminology, minimal acceptable minimum acceptable rate of return, often abbreviated as MARR. <laughs> Thus, UX is the value everyone ought to have in mind before making an investment in an experience. If uh, the experience delivers an entertainment value greater than UX, it is a sound investment. A successful evening. However, if the entertainment value falls short of UX, the investment is unsound. Well, that remains is a stale taste of regret. This is what he writes in his diary. <laughs> and the insight that one has wasted his energy on a transient experience, like chocolate or theater. <laughs> Three weeks later, he breathes his last. Welcome. Act one. This act takes place in Andre's memories of the period when he was unemployed. I'm sorry to bother you, but my name is Peter, and I'm homeless, and I have a little problem. I just found out that my sister's been involved in a car accident. <coughs> she was run over. She's in the hospital. She's in serious but stable condition. I just talked to her, and she's probably going to be okay. But Don't believe her. I, it would really be awfully kind of someone to help me out with a little bit of money so I can travel down there and visit her. It doesn't have to be much. Just a dollar or two. Maybe five. He says that all the time. Maybe someone has some loose change in their pocket. Or their purse. No one? Just a few cents? So I can travel down there and visit my sister? A dollar or two? Maybe a five? Uh, a, a dollar or two? Or maybe a five? She was run over. She was on her way home from work. Someone shoved her into the street. I need money for a train ticket. Just want to travel down there and visit her. No one? Oh, well, thanks anyway. Have a nice evening. It started last fall. Hi, I'm sorry to bother you, but... I was on my way home. I was going up the escalator. I passed through the turnstiles, and there... My, my name is Peter. There he was. And I'm homeless. He had blonde hair, tattoos on his hand, and piercings in his face. I'm in need of a little, a little money for food and shelter. After that, I saw him every day. When I was on my way to night class, when I was buying food, when I was picking up my little brother from some friend's house. Hi, my name is Peter, and I'm homeless. And it didn't take long before I caught on that this dude, he was a fucking pro. Hi, my name is Peter. Nothing about his behavior was left to chance. Hi, my name is Peter, and I'm homeless. In the daytime, he stood between the flower shop and the bakery so that his stink would be masked by the scent of flowers and fresh buns. In the evenings, when there weren't as many people around, he stood further down the tunnel and held open the door for people who were trying to make it to the bus. Here you go. Have a nice evening. And on payday, he always stood over by the ATM. Hi, my name is Peter. A little help for the homeless? Or a little help for a bogus homeless dude who knows exactly how to cheat his way to as much cash as possible. 
And every day, that same goddamn mantra. Hi, my name is Peter. Yeah, we know. Hi, my name is Peter. I live on the street. No, you don't. Dollar or two, maybe five. Okay, that's enough. I was the only one who saw through him. Sure, maybe he smelled bad and, and had scars on his arms, but at the same time... A few cents for a warm meal? He had a cell phone! A little help so I don't have to sleep out in the rain no, at night? No, for real. A seriously flashy cell phone. <laughs> and every time he got a call, he would walk off a little ways so people wouldn't notice. Maybe a five? Honestly, what kind of a homeless dude has a phone like that? And sure, he had a shopping cart full of returnable bottles, but guess what was hidden underneath? Just guess. A guitar case. <clears throat> with a guitar in it. No? Okay then, well, thank you anyway. Have a nice trip. And plus, there was something wrong with his voice. No, okay then. Well, thank you anyway. Have a nice trip. Instead of swearing his words and like cursing, he talked like, sort of like this, with his voice up high, kind of like an actor or something. No, okay then. Well, thank you anyway, my dear sir. Do have a pleasant day. That's exactly how he talked. <laughs> But I was the only one who saw through them. Everyone else just showered him in ones and fives, and one time I saw the lady give him a ten because he had made up some lie about how he needed some money to go and visit his sister. Oh, thank you so much. This will go straight to my travel funds. She's going to be so happy. That's exactly what he said. <coughs> so happy. Sure. Like he had a sister who had been run over. It was so obvious he was lying, and I promised myself that I would never be like him. I was going to finish my night class, learn the system, and get myself a job with a huge salary. Christmas bonus, beautiful secretary, flashy company car. But of course, I, I would keep helping my mom with the rent so she would never again have to sit up all night with a calculator worrying about the next power bill. But you have to watch out for Mamona. What did you say, Mom? Mamona. Don't you let Mamona get her sharp claws into you. Don't worry about it. Because what would happen then? What will happen if Mamona gets into your head? I would start to see the world through Mamona's eyes. And your hands? They would become Mamona's. And your thoughts? They would become Mamona's. And soon you can't do your friends a favor without asking for money, and you can't help your own mother without sending an invoice, and your pupils turn into tiny little black dollar signs. Don't worry. Your morals will turn into a balance sheet. No problem, Mom. I'm not. Your gonna... family will turn into inheritance. Okay, I get it. I get it. I'll watch out for Mamona. I, I, I won't end up like Dad. I will stay myself, and I won't think only about money. Good. That's all I ask. I will not buy an apartment where the elevator opens directly into the front hall, and there's a sound system that knows when I arrive and turns itself on, and there will not be a TV in the kitchen. And a bedroom will not have a real walk-in closet, the kind of the light that comes on is as soon as you open the door with rows and rows of shiny, polished shoes and soft ties and special little hooks and jackets that still have the price tags on them. No. I will keep cutting my own hair. <laughs> and I will never order an entree without checking the price first. Just a plain old job. That was my plan. But nothing went as planned. That autumn went on and my night class ended. I got the second best grades in the class. And after the last class, I stopped by the liquor store. Excuse me. Yes? The champagne, where is it? We have it right over here. And as we walked toward the right shelf, she was thinking. Champagne, what do you want champagne for? But instead, she said. Is there any particular sort of champagne you were looking for? It was a simple question. I, I should have been able to answer it, but. Uh, Hello? Is there any particular sort of champagne you were looking for? <clears throat> Excuse me. Ah, oh, sure, of course. Something with lots of carbonation. I'm sure we'll be able to find something. Uh, this one, for example, has plenty of bubbles. This one is nice, too. It's uh, a bit drier with hints of apple, chocolate, and minerals. But listen, you know, you can always buy sparkling wine instead. It has bubbles, of course. And it tastes more or less the same as champagne, but it's considerably cheaper. Uh, no, no, we want champagne, real champagne. No imposters. We have a degree to celebrate. Oh, 
Oh, uh, lovely. Uh, in that case, I would recommend this one. She held out the bottle, and I, I recognized the label. It had some French name. It's a true classic. I checked the price. Was there anything else? 80 bucks. Hope you enjoy it. 80 fucking dollars. Thank you. I held the bottle tight. I walked to the cash register. There was a line. I stood at the end of it. Mamona, watch out for Mamona. I was trying to make people happy. Eighty dollars for some bubbles? I kept standing there. Didn't you hear me? Eighty dollars? That's two pairs of shoes. That's food for a week. I looked down at the bottle. Hello, it's almost half a month's subway pass. That's eight pizzas. That's... When the line didn't move, I, I went back and switched out the bottle for sparkling wine. Good job. The bottle was the same size and was like the same color. And <laughs> after all, sparkling wine is practically the same thing as champagne. It's good. Cheaper. Then I went home, and I, I, I told them about my grades and showed them my diploma and told my little brother that it was real champagne. What? Seriously? Real champagne? Come on, Tate. Are you crazy? Come on, just a little. Quit it. Just one drop. You're 13. <laughs> just a sip. Come on, just one sip. Okay. Cheers, Cheers to, to the, the future. future. Wow, young. <laughs> so what, so like you can get a job anywhere now? Pretty much. Because it was pretty much true. And what we were drinking was pretty much champagne. And <laughs> mom looked pretty much happy. How much? Huh? How much did it cost, the champagne? Oh, don't worry about it. Just enjoy it. Seriously, how much did it cost? Not that much. But how much? Mom, it doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter. For me, it matters. It's it's sparkling wine, okay? It costs like eight bucks, but don't say, don't say anything either. I can tell it's real. <laughs> <laughs> the fishy thing was, instead of getting disappointed, she looked happy. Her shoulders untensed, and she took a big sip. And when my little brother wanted to taste some more, she liked it. And I thought about that later on. How she seemed to be incapable of enjoying anything expensive. And how relaxed she got when she found that it was cheap. <laughs> and I remember that time my little brother found out that this coat he got was new, not a hand-me-down for me. And how he like he couldn't believe that it had never been worn before. That, that it was brand spanking new. And he, he asked about it over and over. What do you mean it's never been worn before? It's... New. Yeah, but I mean, no one has ever worn it before? No, you idiot, it's new. What? Like, even you never wore it before? No, you idiot, it's new, we just bought it. Stop asking. And he put on his coat, wore it around inside for hours, even though it was this, like, gross shade of green with the black lining. That night, an argument broke out, because Mom wanted him to take it off to sleep, and he refused. And the next day, he wanted to wear it at the breakfast table, and sure, things... Things were a little tight, but it was me and my little brother and my mom against the world, and now everything was going to turn around. I could just feel it. On Monday, I went to the employment agency to register myself, and I wasn't sure how it all worked, so I walked up to the information desk, and the lady behind the register looked up from her computer with eyes that were almost as tired as mom's after a double shift. Yes? <laughs> Hi, uh, I was just wondering how I can get registered. Get registered? Yes. As a job seeker? As a job seeker. Yes. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I need a job. A job. <laughs> mm-hmm. A job. It's not too complicated. Okay. You start by taking four steps back. Can you do that? <coughs> then turn your head 60 or 65 degrees to the left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what does it say there on the sign? That if you want to register as a job seeker, you have to take a number. Oh. So now you need to take a number. Right. Which number did you get? 54. Now you just have to sit down and wait your turn. Can you do that? Wait your turn. I went back and sat down. 47. I waited. 48. 
I remained calm. Renied. I did not jump over the counter. I did not beat her up. I did not kick her unconscious. 50. Instead, I got up and browsed the public computer for job openings. 51. There were tons of them. Audit executives, sales agents, accountants. 52. Executive assistants, business consultants. 53. 53. No 53. 54. Here. Welcome, Andre. Come on in. What can I do for you today? I'd like to get registered as a job seeker. Sure thing. Get that done in a jiffy. Now, I don't suppose you happen to have a resume with you. I do. Oh. <laughs> Wonderful. And don't tell me, you also brought a transcript? Yes, here it is. Oh, that's fantastic. And I don't suppose there's any chance of you have completed some sort of post-secondary schooling as well? I just finished an evening course in basic economics and marketing. Brilliant. Then we'll enter you into the system right away. I, I, I figured I'd have a few jobs that look like they might be a good fit. Hmm. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Except interesting. it sounded more like he was saying... Imbecile, 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 imbecile. <laughs> Excuse me? Well, I mean, I believe many of these employers require slightly different types of experience and education than what you have. But what would you say to sanitation? Sanitation? Mm hmm Sanitation. You appear to be in good physical shape. Do you have any experience working with pressure washers? No. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm really hoping to work with something along the lines of finance or, or, or marketing or like sales, like an executive assistant. Couldn't I start by applying a job like that? Sure. You're right. You have nothing to lose by applying. And, uh, and, and you don't think my, my last name will be a roadblock? I'm sorry? My last name? <laughs> I, I don't think that would be a roadblock. And if it is a roadblock, then it's wrong for it to be a roadblock. Very wrong. But I hope that it won't be a roadblock. But here, just to be on the safe side, take this as well. And then he handed me a list of companies that were looking for industrial sanitation workers. I went home and started applying for jobs. But the guy at the appointment agency was wrong. You have nothing to lose by applying. Bullshit. You lose time. You lose 49 cents for each stamp, 10 cents per envelope, 15 cents for each time you print, and 25 cents for each grade transcript. So that's nothing. 49 plus 10 plus 15 plus 25 equals 99 cents, let's say $1 for every application. $1 is nothing. It's a gas station ice cream. It's two packs of rum. I applied for 10 jobs. 10 jobs times $1 is $10. So $10 is a movie ticket. I applied for 20 jobs. So $20 isn't all that much either. It's dinner and a beer at a crappy restaurant. I applied for 40 jobs. Okay. But no matter what I did, the response was always the same. First, there was a lengthy silence. And then, an envelope. And the thought that now, now it will finally happen. Hello. Thanks for your interest. Many, many applications. Long, complicated process. Unfortunately, it turned out. You are not, <laughs> not, not the one we are looking for. And it is not just because of your bizarrely long and extremely unpronounceable last name. You're underqualified. You are untalented. You look ugly in your attached photo. You're a dumbass. <laughs> We're laughing at you. We put your application on the fridge in the break room, and every time we walk by, we laugh at it like this. <laughs> look at this dumbass we say, holding our hands up to our mouths so we don't spray everyone with pastry crumbs. This dumbass economics would be enough to get hired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and later, when the work day is over, we go home to our apartments where there is no little brother to ask us why we don't move out, why we don't have a job, why we just sit at home licking envelopes all day. But I didn't give up. I thought that if I gave up, I would be just like everyone else. I lowered my standards. I, I applied to janitor jobs. I applied to industrial sanitizing jobs. I applied and applied and always the same answer, the same letters, the same phone calls. Unfortunately. And every time I went down to the convenience store to buy stamps, I saw that little shit Peter standing there with his paper cup full of money. Hi. 
My name is Peter. I'm homeless. <laughs> he had made changes. Hi, my name is Peter. And this is my guitar. He was diversifying his message based on the personal preferences of his customers. Hi, my name is Peter. For a dollar, I'll play a song. I believe the children are our future. <laughs> Teach them well and let them lead the... Oh, oh wait, oh wait. For a dollar, I'll stop singing. <laughs> he understood the market potential of variation. Hi, my name is Peter, and I'm three bucks away from being able to buy some vino. I don't suppose he could help me out. Sometimes he was honest. Sometimes he tried to go around. Hi, my name is Peter, and I'm the CEO of a listed company. Give me a dollar or two to cover my next bailout. But this particular time, he was going with the crying method. He sat there in silence with fake tears in his eyes, rocking back and forth and hugging his knees and checking his phone. When I passed him without seeing him, I, I went to the convenience store, bought my stamps, and then, on the way home... Excuse me. My name is Peter. I'm homeless. And I just found out my sister was run over, and I need money for a train ticket so I can go visit her. I don't suppose he could... Well, it's... transported to Andre's family's home. Then I went home. I stood in front of the mirror. I tried out my interview clothes, my black graduation jacket with my white shirt, and despite the sweatpants, I looked like someone who had a job, who belonged somewhere. Why, hello. How are you? Your hair looks so nice today. I mean, Ty, how about this awful weather? I'll, I'll put it in your mailbox by two. So did you get up to anything fun last weekend? There's a snack in the fridge. But instead of going straight to the kitchen, my brother went to his room to get something, and then he went out again. When he came home, I asked what he was doing. What? What the hell are you doing? Didn't you just get home? I had to run out. I had something to do. What do you mean something you had to do? To take care of some stuff. What do you mean take care of some stuff? You're 13 years old. You don't have anything to take care of. <laughs> Tell me what you were doing. I, I had to drop something off. What kind of something? There was a person I had to help. What are you talking about? My brother didn't want to say I could tell something was wrong, so I followed him into the kitchen. Come on, who are you going to help? And how? Tell me. Don't think you can pull a fast one on me. Look, do you need help with anything? Someone being mean to you at school? No, what? it's nothing like that. I was, I was helping a homeless guy. Not the one with the guitar. His sister got run over. He needed money for a train. You gave him money? How much? Quit it. Tell me how much you gave him. How much did you give him? You, you got a little idiot. Huh? Tell me how much you gave him. You gave him a five? Did you give him more than a five? Tell me right now, you fucking little gullible pussy. How much did you give him? Don't tell me you gave him a ten. It was huh? my money. It, what do you mean your money? You get your money from mom, and she gets it from her boss. It was not your fucking money. How much did you give him? I can do whatever I want with my money. Yeah, you're right. Of course you can do whatever you want with your money. But just tell me, I'm, I'm curious. How much did you give him? Was it, was it more than a 10? I swear I won't do anything, all right? <laughs> just tell me so I know. How much was it? And I admit it. I was a little frustrated. He roared. What are you, totally fucking stupid? I was annoyed. He shouted, you gullible fucking little idiot pussy. How the hell did you believe him? I said I, I was going to go down to the metro and have a talk with that homeless guy. I'm going to find that cocksucker. Do you hear me? I'm going to find him and teach him a lesson. You don't fucking take money from children. You just don't. I left the apartment and took the elevator down the street. I could tell there was going to be a fight. There was no fight. <sighs> I did not let my rage get the better. His knuckles were bloody when he got back. I went over there, and I talked to the homeless guy and convinced him to give me back the money. He washed his hands in the bath and he got red stains on his towel. I went to my brother's room and I handed him the $50 bill and, and apologized for losing my temper. He said, why are you crying? Are you a fag? <laughs> I explained that, that we have to stick together. We're a family. We can't trust anyone, especially not fucking homeless people who will say anything for money. 
He said, if you give your money away again, I will kill you. Do you hear me? I will kill you. I comforted him. He said, now stop crying or else I'll beat on you too. <laughs> then we hugged and I went to my own room. <laughs> right? We met up, didn't we? One month later, they called from the convenience store and asked if I wanted to come in and work for a trial period. I was finally on my way. Moving on up. Interlude. Nanny sits at the edge of the stage. I stay put, lying in the same position, falling without falling. I lie there, flat out, stiff breeze in my hair, birds motionless in the sky, the ground and the gravel and, and the bike rack far away. I have all the time in the world. And no one at work has realized what's going on. One, one of the guys is reaching for his thermos. His armpit hair glistens in the sun. And another guy is about to stand up. He's stooping as if he's performing a dance move. And he, he will stand like that forever. He will never stand up. And I will never. The year is 1973. Laura Lorenzo is about to begin studying pre-law at the prodigious Stanford University when the United States National Bank in San Diego <coughs> collapses. Collapses? What do you mean collapses? Uh, the bank goes under. But my parents have all their savings there, their retirement money, my college fund. Uh, not anymore. So where is it? Uh, the money? It's gone. Disappeared, went up in smoke, speculated away. By who? Uh, Conrad Arnholt Smith, bank director, tuna fish producer, baseball fanatic, and Nixon lover. Uh, wasn't it a large, well-established bank? I know tons of people who did their banking there. Deposits totally more than one billion dollars vanished in the collapse. I think he spent a long time in jail. He did. Eight months <laughs> and thirty thousand dollars in damages. Completely unabated. So now what? How are my parents supposed to? Laura's father sells his farm and looks for a job as a long-distance bus driver. Laura's mother gets a job at a beauty salon. What about me? Laura is forced to stay in San Diego. Oh, shit. She gets a job selling tickets in a movie theater on the side and starts studying economics at a local university. Thus, UX is the value everyone ought to have in mind before making an investment in an experience. And this is where she encounters Van Houten's theorem. And she thinks. What a load of bullshit. This guy has never had to decide not to do something. A few weeks later, she has worked out a formula that she boldly called Lorenzo's Law. Formulated on August 24th, 1976. After an evening shift at work, Lorenzo writes Van Houten's theorem needs an update. Because an experience is never just. An experience. Every experience has alternative costs and a time aspect. Or to be more scientific. An effective experience must deliver a value of ux plus r plus t, where ux is Van Houten's coefficient of entertainment, r stands for the audience's expenditures for spatial transportation, and t represents time. So, UX plus R plus T, where R represents all the expenses that the investing party has accrued in order to transport himself to the experience in question. I mean, this could be the cost of gas, parking fees, or train tickets. It could be some nourishment with which the investor has filled his body in order to have the energy to leave home. The T in the formula stands for the potential loss of time that an investor ought to be compensated for. As Lorenzo herself writes in the article she submits to the journal Econometrica in March of 1977. Picture this. At this very moment, a person who has invested in an experience could be doing something completely different. Petting a cat. <laughs> or teaching a grandchild to make a fire, or getting drunk, or starting a revolution. And this is what Van Houten overlooked. The article is not accepted due to its lack of scientific tone. <laughs> Idiots. Much later, the article is discovered by a certain doctoral candidate in the history of economics who is known for entertaining alternative lectures. 
inspired by free thinkers such as Van Houten and Lorenzo, he begins to work on his utopian dissertation, which will destroy capitalism from within. Act two. I was at work at the convenience store writing up a plan. All we need is a little bit of land, not much, 40 acres, or 25, that might be enough. 15 acres of field, three for vegetables, and seven for pasture. Everything will be certified organic and cruelty-free and biodynamic. Hi, you have scratch-off tickets. Of course, how many? Two. No, give me three. Three tickets. Here you go. You don't need that many animals. Maybe 20 or 25 ewes, a few lambs, a ram, a few geese, maybe some duck, maybe hen. One scratch-off ticket, please. Here you go. In our fields, we grow grass for grazing, fall corn, oats, spelt, and potatoes. And in the vegetable garden, we grow carrots, onions, beets, white cabbage, red cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, kohlrabi, rutabaga, parsnips, leeks, string beans, butter beans, <coughs> pickling cucumbers. I have the post and, and a scratch off ticket, please. Here you go. All we need is a tractor. Simple little tractor. And electric clippers for sharing the sheep. Excuse me? Yes? Yes? <coughs> Can I help you with something? My stamps? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Here you go. <laughs> would you like a scratch-off ticket, too? No, thanks. Uh, that's all. Er, hold on. Yes, I would. Here you go. The house is simple. A composting toilet indoors, an outhouse, too, heated by a wood stove. We'll get our hot water from a thermal tank. The wood will come from the forest, and the fish will come from the lake, and the apples will come from the orchard. Hey. Listen, I don't suppose you're hiring me? I'm between jobs right now, and, and my background is in sales <coughs> and marketing, and I can see quite a bit of underutilized sales potential um, here. I don't think we need anyone just right now, but I'm not the owner, so you can always drop off an application. Oh, great. I'll just put that here, and we'll be in touch if anything comes up. Thanks. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Where was I? The land, the earth, the house, the quiet, the self-sufficiency, the freedom. What about the smell? Mm -hmm. Martina too, a copy of Martina entered. What? What will we do about the smell? What smell? The owl house, the composting toilet, the manure, oh, the animals. Used to it. How long have we been working here? Six months? Six months? Two years, four months, and three days, and we still haven't gotten used to this smell. Stop complaining. Hey. Coffee, homeless people, old fruit, newspaper ink. Ugh, we can go home, Kim. And then we have to meet with the job cut. Do you know what we should do before then? Buy some new perfume. We can't afford new perfume. Maybe we could call our parents and ask them. We them. don't need new perfume. Do you hear me? We have everything we need. We have a perfectly adequate job, which we hate. We have an apartment. A damp two room apartment with alcoholic neighbors in a neighborhood that our friends are afraid to visit. We have a boyfriend, Cheeto shaped, financially incompetent. Well, we have a wonderful daughter. That's true. We want for nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Except a career. But that will change soon. Martina, too, shoves Martina in to see the job coach. I finally went in. Nice elevator. I signed in with the receptionist and took a seat in the waiting room. Ooh, nice coffee machine. Yeah, this is really promising. And I went to the bathroom. Look at this toilet paper. And when I came back out, there she was. Welcome. She introduced herself and we went into her office. She smells so good. Hi, is this the first time you've met with a job coach? I nodded and looked up at the clock. Oh my god, I'm dying. Look at that clock. Are you feeling nervous? I must have cost a fortune. No, not particularly. That's great. Well, how about if I start by explaining how this usually goes, shall I? Mm -hmm. So, the package your parents have purchased includes nine coaching sessions, 12 open seminars, which are completely voluntary, and then there's what we call a DISC analysis. As she spoke, I thought about other things. Mm -hmm. DISC stands for Dominance, Inducement, Submission, and Compliance, where dominance has to do with power and control. Interesting. I thought about how spells is a good prop to have in the rotation because it's easy to grow and its foliage suppresses weeds. Submission is more about patience and persistence. And potatoes are good because it helps the dirt and fights the weeds. Please listen. I also think we'll need a few role-playing exercises to help you feel confident. 
confident when it comes to your next job interview. I thought about my family's strange relationship to money, and Felicia, who was at daycare, and Aunt Solve, who was on her deathbed, and that voice I had started hearing again, and the minutes which were ticking by. My goal during these sessions is to help you reach your goal. Do you understand? Wow, time flies when you're having fun. Do you have any questions for me? Me? Yes, is there anything that you're wondering about? How much the clock cost? Where she got her perfume? Questions? Questions. Of course I have questions. Why does everything feel so wrong? How can the banking sector be larger than our entire economy? How can I give my daughter a secure future when the world is heading for ruin? What am I supposed to, how am I supposed to, where am I supposed to get my hands on 25 acres of cropland? How do you rent a bunker? Where do you buy gas masks? Masks and survival shit and protective suits? And why is it good for parsnips to be sewn after cabbages? What kind of perfume are you wearing? Shut up. <laughs> why do people say, I see, and how long do you plan to stay there when I tell them about my job? And why does everyone say that I need to Perfume. fulfill my potential? And how do you put a stop to a horrible voice that insists on measuring the world in numbers and dollars and in percents? Me? And why am I standing here thinking up all these questions when deep down inside I know I will never ask them? Anything? Anything at all? No. I don't think so. Okay. How about if I ask you this instead? What is your personal goal for these sessions? Where would you like to be when we're done seeing each other? I would like, hmm, uh, or yeah, I am, um, I would really like to be rid of this voice inside my head. I'm not a voice. A uh, voice? Okay. I'm your true self. Or, well, I guess it might sound weird, but sometimes when I'm by myself. Not just when you're by yourself. I feel like I hear a voice in my head that isn't me at all. Yes. Which I would really like to get rid of. And uh, what, uh, what does this voice sound like? Like God himself. Like a very, very irritating person. <laughs> Haters gonna hate. <laughs> and <clears throat> voices aren't exactly my specialty, but where do you think it comes from, this voice? Heaven, my family. And what would happen if you started to obey the voice? What? Who would you become if you followed the advice of this voice? She's good. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be like everyone else in my family. And all I'd care about would be money. And I'd quit my job at the convenience store and go back to school for something totally disgustingly boring. Like what? Like accounting. And then I would tell Manny about my family's money, and then he'd want to get married, and then he would get infected by the voice. And we would have a wedding, just like my sisters. And now it is time for the lovely couple to exchange their vows, Martina. Darling. My darling, darling. I love you. I want to spend my life with you. A wise man once said, what else is life but a wonderful pursuit of various kinds of capital? <laughs> Financial capital, venture capital, and social capital. You are all these types of capital. <laughs> I love you with all my heart, yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you. Men, my darling, darling, I promise to continue investing <laughs> as much as I possibly can in our relationship. My demand for your supply <laughs> will always have an incredibly elastic price sensitivity. <laughs> and it's no secret how I feel about ineffective markets. <laughs> but the monopoly that you have on my heart is something I will never, never want to dissolve. And the time we spend <laughs> together is, has, has a steadily increasing surplus dividend. And that is why <laughs> I want to build a financial entity with I, and, and create future consumers who will contribute to the GDP and increase our expected earnings. May we not have to take too many baths with our goods. I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the bride, but uh, before you do, here's the receipt for my participation in this incredibly <laughs> beautiful ceremony. And to all the rest of you, I just want to say that in addition to weddings, I also do funerals, baptisms, and birthday parties. <laughs> Sounds like
like we have an exciting journey ahead of us, but that's all the time we have for today. Oh, already? I stood up to leave. Ask her how much she costs. I said, thank you. How much do you cost? I put out my hand and said, just one more thing, but it might be a little personal. Go ahead. How much do you charge? Excuse me? How much do you cost? How much are my parents paying for this? Do you feel that it is of great importance for you to know? Oh, come on, I'm not stupid. <laughs> I saw the secretary and the coffee machine and the tea lights in the waiting room and the toilet paper. So, of course, I'm curious about how much you cost. Give me a ballpark figure. She costs more than $100 per hour. Is it important for you to have an exact number? More than $150? Do they pay you more than $200 per hour? Say they do. Say your parents had chosen to pay more than $200 per session. Isn't that a sign of how much they care about you? How important it is for them for you to fulfill your potential? No, don't say that word. I hate that word. And, ugh, oh, forget it. I just want to know how much your time is worth. My time is worth $8 an hour. Under the table. No, neither we can pay. No social security. That's how much I earn when I stand behind a counter at a convenience store. And yet my time is still far too valuable for me to ever come back here. No. What are you doing? Say your story. I walk to the lobby. I pass the reception. No, come back. Don't run away. I knew I would never come back here again. Then a few weeks went by, and Felicia fell down at daycare and ripped a hole in her snowsuit. Fifty dollars for a new one. Nanny's bike was stolen. Shit. One hundred dollars to buy one used. And I did my shopping at different stores to find sales, and I tweaked recipes so they would fit our budget. And when it said salmon, I used pollock. And when it said pine nuts, I didn't use any pine nuts. And when mom called my cell phone, I answered. Hello? What's going on? I'm still late last night. Yes! How is dad doing? Who's going to get the cottage? When is the funeral? Ask what we got. Ask what we got. Was it? Was there any? Did she leave a will? The cottage. Tell me we got the cottage. The China and the tea service. Maybe this is an awkward question, but who got the cottage? Oh. It went to Angelica. No, of course. No, no. I understand. No. She no. has such a great no. mom. No. <laughs> That's so great for her. Say it's not fair. Shh. Tell her hi and congratulations. Say we'll come to the funeral. I'll see you at the funeral. Oh, no, I'll ask off from work. And I did. I took time off. I rode the commuter train to the church. And all the while, I tried to my remind myself that I am not her. No, you're really not. I sat in the second row of pews, dressed in black, and I listened to the organ music, and I mourned on Solveig's death. I sat beside her and thought about how much the tea service would be worth if we sold it. I thought about the scattered memories I had of on Solveig. I read a pawn shop online. The time she showed me how to use an egg beater. Maybe it would be better to just divide it up and sell it separately, spoon by spoon. Big brown tears rolled down my cheeks. Or you could melt down the tea service and make one solid lump of silver. I thought about the cottage. I wonder how much the cottage is worth compared to the tea I service. I thought about everything we could have done with the cottage. Build up a self-sustaining small-scale farm. Mm -hmm. Or quickly put it in Felicia's name to avoid taxes and then renovate it and resell it. Then the funeral was over and I went back to work and relieved Erica. I came along. She had been smoking in the storeroom and there were two ice cream wrappers in the office waste basket. Check and see if they're written down in the employee purchase log. No, of course not. Incredible. Two ice creams a day once a week is over $100 per year. But I calmed <laughs> down, told myself, it wasn't that much money. Every little drop counts. I stacked newspapers and refilled the ice in the soda machine and hid old fruit behind fresh fruit. And I waved at Peter. <sighs> Peter. Uh, what? Why are you waving at him? Because I like him. He's nice. He's not like the other homeless people. I have a policy. I only say hello to people who are contributing members of society. Lay off. He's not doing any harm. The question is, what good does he do? Oh, calm down. Don't feel sorry for him. I never went back to the job coach. I kept working at the convenience store. And I sold the china and tea service online. <laughs> for a while, it seemed like I had conquered the boys. One weekend, I went into the city to go to an eco-friendly market. And the people behind the stands looked so friendly and happy and tanned. And I wanted to buy it all, but I couldn't afford it. So once I had tasted everything there was to taste, I asked if they took cards. And they said, no. So 
I said I would be back soon. Save that cucumber for me. <laughs> I said, and that cheese too. <laughs> then I kept walking through the city and I tried not to think about how worn out my clothes were compared to everyone else's. Then my phone rang and it was Angelica. So I answered it anyway. Hello. Hi, sweetie. How are Hi. you? Fine, thanks. How are all of you? Yes. Oh, we're great. Thanks. Really, really great, actually. I could hear it in her voice. That something wonderful had happened. You know that cottage? She was relishing that. That cottage we got from Aunt Sobe, remember? Mm -hmm. Guess what we found in the basement? Some old paintings, and of course, I was about to throw them out. I'm so stupid. But you know, Anders, he took them to the appraise this week, and we got our answer today. And guess what they're worth? I can't handle this! Come on, give me a number. No, because that's our cottage, not hers. A little more. We want it because we are the ones who never get anything for free. A little bit more. We're the ones who have to work at a goddamn convenience store to make enough for our rent. And our boyfriend is the one who's financially incompetent and who refuses to give up on his dream of changing the system from inside. It's not fair. Tell her it's not fair. Congratulations! Thanks. <laughs> Sometimes you just get lucky. Ask a fucking goddamn stick anus. God, that's... Great, congratulations. And we hung up, and I pictured how my sister was sitting there in her perfect yard, with her perfect hair, in her perfect neighborhood, with her perfect sons who are never allowed to play soccer on the perfect lawn because the blades of grass might break off at the wrong height, and then her mother would cry perfect fat tears that would bloom like flowers on her perfectly ironed blouse. <laughs> Let's go in here. I walked into a department store. I walked to the makeup counter. Take off your raincoat. Under the raincoat, I would wear a shirt with sausage struggling off stains. There it is. Look. There it is. The perfume. Want to fire her and replace her with this guy. My background is in sales and marketing, and I can see quite a bit of underutilized sales potential in here. Erica got fired and was replaced by Andre, and I taught him all the routines. I showed him how to clean the hot dog roller, the defrost the ice cream cooler, and more and more often, I would take time off and walk around the city instead of working. Enjoy yourself. Pedicure, a manicure, a hair mask. I threw out the lunches, many packs for me, and ate out. And how are you feeling? I feel okay. Be mm -hmm. honest now. I was happy. Be honest. For the first time in several years, I felt really, really content. The intermission speaker enters. That's it. That's the play. It's over. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Just kidding. Did anybody go with me? Some of you maybe. Well, at least it was free. You didn't have to pay anything to come see this. No, no UX to speak of or anything. God forbid you paid ten dollars and won it back. No warranty on these things. Um, but let's get real for a second. Is anybody in here worried about finances right now? Is that why you came to maybe a, a free play reading? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. Nobody's worried. Great. Good for us. Why should you worry? It's just numbers <laughs> and coins and dollars, right? We all know how to you know, scrape together a little cash when we need it. Because, as I always say, you've never really lived until you've been broke. Am I right? <laughs> Am I right? Really, and all you know, we've all been broke at some point in our lives, sometime or other. And I mean, like, really, really broke, not just like, honey, maybe we should uh, cut down on our restaurant budget. Do we really need three cars? I, I, I mean, like, really broke. You know, you're, you're standing at the meat counter, trying to choose between real choice cuts of meat and cheapo clearance stuff, looking between one and the other. Finally, you put them both away, you can go walk to the canned goods. Get in line, standing there, totally ashamed of your cheap products, thinking, everybody's looking, everybody knows. You walk up to the register, swipe a card, gets declined, swipe it again, gets declined again, and say, oh, that's weird, there must be a problem with the bank or something. <laughs> you walk to the ATM, you have a warm receipt in your hand, looking at the negative balance, the black dizziness hits you at the top, that your rent is due soon. We all know that your friends don't answer your calls on certain dates. We all know how to poke around in coat pockets, look under sofa cushions for any coins you might be lying around. You don't have to bet, it's all lying around there somewhere. 
We've all been there, right? Hi, my name is Stephen. <laughs> but we don't get worked up over the fact that there are people who don't have the same old rules. I'm sorry to bother you. After all, we live in the best of worlds. All you have to do is, is pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It doesn't have to be much. Claw your way in. Don't give up. A dollar or two, maybe five. Because people who give up turn out like him. What? Can you come here for a second? Students. Me? Yeah, you. What for? Let's make a deal. Yeah. Look at this. I'll give you $10 if you dunk your head in that bucket of water. What for? Uh, for fun. It'll increase the evening's UX, won't it? Wouldn't it be fun to see how long he can hold his breath? It's just water. Ten dollars? Ten dollars. Okay, great. Go ahead. Peter dunks his head into the bucket. I feel like he's got a stopwatch or something. Pretty impressive, huh? When Peter finally comes back up, he catches his breath. Okay. Just two more times. What do you mean two more times? You, you didn't say anything about two more times. We said three times. We said three times, right? If you do it three times, I'll give you $10. Now, come on, just two more times. Take a breath if you have to. Ready? Let's go. He's fine. It's fascinating, actually. Did you know that the left lung is just a little bit smaller than the right lung because it shares part of the chest with your heart? Isn't that special? <laughs> Peter's body flounders. He tries to come up. At last, he lets go. <coughs> Very good. Where are you going? What do you mean? I'm going to pay you. Ten dollars. Okay. Let's say 60 bucks. 60 bucks in your hand, then you can go. Either that, or I can give it to somebody else. Does anybody want to get their face a little wet for 60 bucks? Just stick your head in the water for a minute, tops. Then you can walk off stage and you're safe. You will have come out on top this evening. Anybody? Look, we have towels. I'll do it. I'll do it, okay. Great. The intermission speaker pushes Peter into the bucket and holds him down even though his limbs flail and he does all he can to come back up. It lasts longer than the time before. Peter flails and then lies still. The intermission speaker lifts him <laughs> out of the water, revives him, and sticks the money in his pocket. Hey! You all right? You still with us? <laughs> You're done. You can go home now, or home. You can have a glass of water if you need to. Okay, uh, I guess we're done here, but you know how it is. The show must go on. Here we go. Act three. We are transported to the other city. Freya enters. I saw it happen. Everyone saw it happen, but no one had time to react. She looked the wrong way. It happened so fast. Suddenly, she was just lying there. We return to the capital city and enter Manny's memory of his death. You will end up just like me. Just you wait. That's what he would say to me in the morning in the kitchen. After his night shift as his painkiller tablets were fizzing in the glass of water. You will end up like me. <laughs> Dad was wrong. I didn't end up like him. My body didn't break down thanks to four different part-time jobs. My back never suffered a slipped disc. I didn't retire on disability. Uh, I've stopped drinking, and my family will never split up just because I spent all my time chasing after money. Dad was the one whose life revolved around maximizing dollars and cents, not mine. Right, darling? 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 Oh, definitely not. We have other priorities. We don't have much, but what we have, we are careful with. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what we always said at first. You remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, when, when we were both studying at the university, we lived on, in a water-damaged apartment. Mm -hmm. We made up our own dish called cottage cheese noodles. <laughs> Good 
Here's how to make it. Boil noodles, put cottage cheese on them. Uh-huh, and, uh, and, and then put a little herb salt oh, on top. Oh, right, the herb salt was important. Uh, we rolled our own <laughs> cigarettes, and we drank cheap wine uh, from cups we without borrowed, handles. Um, we stole. We silverware. Uh, and we toilet paper, paper too. Yeah, we lived on practically no money. Uh, we, we didn't <laughs> even think about money. We, but, but <laughs> time has changed us, or at least one of us, um, like when we were going to buy a stroller. Darling, I have a suggestion. Let's each make a list that describes our dream stroller, and then we'll compare them. Dream stroller? Ready? Go. <laughs> uh, and, and, and just to avoid argument, I made a list describing my so-called dream stroller. Um, cheap? <laughs> Good brakes, uh, tall push handle, three things that were important to me. But she just. One, swiveling front wheel with a shopping cart. And I have to say. Two, a large storage basket. Her list was a little bit longer. Five, a safety rated frame and reflective bars. She came from a different background. Twelve, a reversible aeronautics seat. She was just used to different standards. Nineteen, puncture resistant tires. And I remember thinking. Twenty two, UV protection and ventilation holes in the reclining seat. When does she do this kind of thing? 24, removable safety bar. And how much time does she spend on it? 25, optional coffee cup holder. Mm. And why did she, the, the person who loved smoking cigarette butts that came oh. from ashtrays and drinking wine out of broken mugs when we, back when we met, suddenly want a stroller that costs an entire month's salary? You know, but well, we were perfectly well off. Uh, no, I mean, we weren't poor. Yeah, and I, I, I had my adjunct job at the department. But we had a cushion. But our cushion was getting smaller and smaller. But we were in no way poor. Definitely not. And, and even if we argued sometimes, we always kept a unified front. We are transported to a couple's dinner. Um, well, you know, of course, money can get a little tight sometimes. But isn't that true for everyone? Yeah, I, I mean, exactly. I'm 99% I'm sure that I will get that permanent position in the spring. And I started looking for a part-time job. Of course, and, and uh, other people have it so much worse, like unemployed youth. The homeless. Um, undocumented. Undocumented, unemployed, homeless uh, youth. Right, right, <laughs> our, our regular old adults who don't know what their finances are going to look like. We know exactly how much our income is and mm -hmm. exactly how much is left over after we pay rent, yeah. pay for our metro passes and phone bills and electricity and our debt to our neighbors and friends yeah, we and, know, and aunts. We, we know uh, exactly what time of month we have to stop Juice. Or buy juice that's not really juice. Yeah, or, or cut down on fruit. Or, I mean, uh, or, or, or uh, mm -hmm. cut down on uh, that fruit more. that costs more than a certain price per pound. Or right. just cut down on fruit. Yes, and that's the kind of thing that you have to do mm -hmm. so that you can treat yourself uh, on other things later. Mm -hmm. So you can travel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you have a cushion. Last summer, uh, actually, oh, well, actually, yeah, actually, we, we stayed, stayed home, home last summer. summer. <laughs> um, but the summer before that, we, we stayed home actually. Because <laughs> I was but pregnant. But you were pregnant and I was between jobs. But, but the, the summer, summer before, before that, that uh, yeah. we also stayed home. <laughs> <laughs> but it, the city is really oh, lovely this yeah. time of year. It's just um, it, it, it's it, quiet and empty. Yeah, and you can walk around and imagine that you own the city. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have much. But we have each other. We are transported to the other city. I saw it happen. Everyone saw it, but no one had time to react. Suddenly, she was just lying there. She'd been run over, and the car stopped further on, and the driver didn't dare to approach, but we did. It was like we made a circle. Everyone came too close, so someone yelled, back off, and then people backed off. The ambulance showed up in just a few minutes. Must have been a coincidence. It must have been nearby. I stood there with her purse. I don't know how it ended up in my arms, but I just wanted to help. And that's why everyone thought that I had been with her. And soon I was sitting beside her in the ambulance, and we rushed with the lights and sirens toward the ER. And I looked at her and her skin, and it didn't look too bad. There was just a little blood coming from the cuts, and her one leg was broken. Anyone could see that because the bone was sticking straight out under her dress. You could see white through the fabric, and it almost looked a little funny, but I realized that if I started laughing, they might misinterpret it. So I sat there quietly, and I listened to the sirens, and the ambulance attendant pressed on her <laughs> chest and placed a rubber mask over her perfectly shaped lips and asked me what her name was, and instead of looking through her purse, 
I saved time by setting up her name with my name. We were transported to Manny and Martina's home. Later, she found a job at the convenience store, and then we had a little more of a cushion. I hate every second of it. Although she didn't like it very much at first. I hate the customers. I hate that it smells like old smoke. I hate the rotten fruit and the leaky coffee machine. And then, all of a sudden, one day, she started enjoying her job. I talked to Peter today. Peter? You know, that homeless guy. The one I told you about. It was actually really pleasant. And I was clueless. Peter. His name is Peter. Peter? Yeah, he usually panhandles outside the convenience store. First, she only mentioned him in passing. Guess who came into the store today? Peter, the homeless guy. I gave him some fruit. And then he started popping up more and more often. Peter stopped by today. He helped me make some change. He always has a lot of coins. I was busy with my lectures. I was I was collecting material on Mamona and Van Houten's theorem and Lorenzo's law. Isn't it cool how some people are brave enough to do the opposite of what everyone else does and just plant themselves totally outside the rest of society? And I thought, as soon as I get a permanent position, I will destroy capitalism from the inside. I wish, we, I wish we could do that, Manny. Get our hands on some land and move out to the country and become totally self-sufficient. I didn't say anything. I wasn't listening. I, I, I tried not to think what I was thinking. What were you thinking? Oh, it doesn't matter. No. Tell me. No, I wasn't. I wasn't thinking anything. Yeah, but you said that you were thinking things you didn't want to think. That's that's what he said. Now tell me. It was nothing. I want to know. I promise not to be mad. Tell me what you were thinking. Well, <laughs> like maybe I was thinking like, wow, what are you talking about? You stupid upper class little girl. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you want to become a self-sufficient as a homeless person? You would last about 20 minutes on an organic farm. Max. Th then you would call up your filthy rich parents and ask them to send a taxi so you could come back home to your mansion and the pool and the fancy grill and soak up the feeling of security. Uh, was there anything else you were thinking that you might Yeah, have yeah, I might have been thinking, um, there is nothing more fucking disgusting than the passion that the rich feel for poverty. You know? Your fake moist eyes when you catch a glimpse of a person who is weak. Your warm hands, which are supposed to help, um, care for, fuss over, be there, and pick up the pieces, but only as long as poverty comes in a pretty little package. Amusing and harmless, you know, there, there has to be limits. There, there has to be a, um, a work of art or a stage, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, user experience value, this, this lack of resources must never, never pop up unexpectedly in your living room, right? Or in your stairwell, or on your doorstep of your home in your country. Poverty is not allowed to follow you home after a visit. It has to end when the applause does, because otherwise you would be reminded that poverty isn't beautiful or amusing or heroic. Poverty chafes and aches. It silences and shames. Poverty is backs that bends and frame friends that betray and ligaments that snap and tongues that go silent and dads who disappear. Except that he does, in practice, what you write about in theory. <laughs> and that sentence saved itself inside me like a bank deposit and grew with exponential interest. <laughs> he does, in practice, what you write about in theory. And of course, Dad's constant, you will end up like me. Just wait. We are transported to the other city. 
we arrived at the ER and they carted her off and asked who I was. And I told them the truth. We're work colleagues and we have the same job. And I wasn't lying, it was almost true, except that they had fired me and hired her. And then I said the same thing to the nurse on the ward and she was gonna be operated on right away. They registered her under my name and I thought it was fitting. I thought they can change that later once everything is cleared up. The important thing right now is for them to revive her as quickly as possible. It will be okay, won't it? I said to the nurse who still didn't want to let me in the operating room. She nodded and said, we're doing everything we can. And then she locked the door and vanished. And I went to the waiting room where there were three cookies and juice and coffee and tea. And I took a few tea bags and stuffed them in my pocket and a few cookies. And I drank a little coffee and I thought, every cloud has a silver lining. Mandy and Martinez Hope. The day before I was going to give the last lecture of the semester, we were sitting in front of the TV. Will you find out tomorrow? Our daughter had fallen asleep. They'll call tomorrow, right? You think you're going to get it? I don't know. I, they said a lot of people applied for the position. I have a good feeling about it. Why else would they have given you so many instructional hours? I changed the channel on the TV and sighed so she would get that I didn't want to talk about it anymore, about the permanent position. <laughs> I was already nervous because we were changing because she was drifting away. Mandy, it's a tenure track job. Huh. Who would have thought it back then when we were stealing spoons from the university cafe? On TV there was this black and white movie where a woman fainted and a man laid her on a chaise long. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Peter told me something really funny. When he was little, he thought those were called chaise lawn. And he wondered, who is she? Why is her lawn like that? <laughs> And all of a sudden, right there, on the couch, I figured out what had happened. Everything turned into one big pattern. Her, her new perfume, her hairstyle, the bouquet of flowers. Hi, my name is Peter. I'm homeless. Hi, Peter. Would you like to come into the store and talk for a while? Hi, my name is Peter. I'm homeless. Yes, so you said. But come over here behind the counter. I'll show you something. Hi, my name is Peter. I'm homeless and I have a present for you. Oh, wow. How lovely. I have had my eye on this perfume for years. But how could you afford? What? You believe that I was homeless? For real? Of course I'm not. I was just doing research for an upcoming role. I'm actually a famous actor who can give you everything your boyfriend can't afford. Oh, yes, I knew it. Come here, into the storeroom, and Peter and Martina have sex. <laughs> and my name is Peter, and I'm homeless. I love it when you say that. Say it again. My name is Peter, say it again. and I'm homeless. Yes, say that you're outside I, the system. I'm outside the system. Say that you're everything my boyfriend is not. I'm everything your boyfriend is not. Oh! Um, <laughs> stay with me. No, Peter. If you only knew how much I would like to do that, but I can't. I have to go home to my loser of a boyfriend. I hope he realizes how lucky he is. He doesn't. <laughs> work, by the way. Right now he's an instructor at the university in the history of economics. presenter on TV was talking about an international report that estimated the amount of money that goes untaxed and is kept hidden from all the tax authorities of the world at, at between 21 and 32 trillion dollars. You seem so preoccupied. I changed the channel. I thought, 32 trillion dollars? That's 32,000 billion. And 32,000 billion is 32 million million. Hello? Are you listening? And I nodded, yes. I said yes. Uh, I was trying to listen to her, and I changed the channel to a documentary about killer whales. Oh, you know who loves sharks? <laughs> Peter! <laughs> huh. But those are killer whales, darling. If you can't tell the difference between a killer whale and a shark, 
I think you should ditch your plans of becoming an organic farmer. <laughs> she didn't say anything. <laughs> Documentary kept playing on TV, and then she stood up and walked to the bathroom. She was right. She took her phone with her to text him from the bathroom. I kept sitting there. I, I got up to go to the kitchen and have a little nip from my bottle, some pop of mint to hide the smell. I tried not to think about what would happen now. The first excuses, staying with a friend, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call if I'm gonna be late. The sex, so much, so different, so much better. Break up, custody battle, I'll have to move out, he'll get to move in. I won't see Felicia on the weekends, if that. When I came to bed, she, she had turned out the light, and I should have woken her up. I should have said, I'm sorry, I'm feeling stressed out about tomorrow. I'm sorry, I, 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 I haven't been able, I'm sorry that I haven't been able to give you the life that you deserve. But that's because the people who have the money hide it, and you know how much $32 trillion is? Do you know how much you want to know? this much. <laughs> but I didn't wake her up. I just crawled into bed beside her and I tried to fall asleep. The other city. After the operation, they came out with her and several hours had passed and I was still there. I had sat there in the waiting room eating cookies and drinking coffee and juice. You could drink as many glasses as you wanted, and no one would say anything. And they rolled her into the room, and I could tell that she would be okay. There was life in her skin, even though it was pale, and even though her face was covered by that mask, and the doctor said it was serious, I knew she wouldn't die, and I tried not to look disappointed. I smiled. I showed what I wanted was best for her, and after the doctors left, I sneaked into the room and sat down next to her with her purse in my lap, and I whispered, I'm here now so that she would feel safe and calm because a nurse said that she might be able to hear even if she couldn't respond. I sat there for half an hour or so and said nice calming things. I said we were co-workers and it was almost 8.30 at night and that there was a room with free juice and cookies and coffee out in the hall and if I'm not here then I'm sitting in there and when you wake up all you have to do is call for me and I'll come, okay? There was an old man in the same room, but they rolled him out before she got there. And his side was full of flowers and bouquets, and next to the radio, there was even a box of chocolates in plastic wrapping, and I thought it was unfair that he had so much and she had so little, so I moved two of the bouquets to her side. I took away the cards, and I tasted a piece of chocolate. I could tell it had been bought. It didn't have that dusty taste the old chocolate can get. It was soft, and it melted in my mouth. Wake up now. Wake up now so we can eat chocolate and decide what to do tomorrow. The capital city. Dad said, you're going to end up like me. But that wasn't true. <laughs> because he had never gotten a phone call from his department that said, I'm sorry, the permanent position has gone to someone else. And Dad never had to go into a university bathroom and run water so no one would hear what was going on. Oh, I went to the lecture hall. It had 200 seats and 13 students. It was my last lecture, and I swore to myself that it would be different. Welcome. Nice to see so many of you here. <laughs> Although there aren't that many of you. No one laughs. The history of economics. Why? And for whom? Alchemist, utopian, and revolutionary August Nordenskull has the answer. He is born in Sibyl Parish in Finland in 1754. His life's work, the production of gold. One guy's falling asleep. <laughs> Two girls are looking at the phone. In 1779, King Gustav III sends Nordenskull to London to learn how to make gold. While in London, Norton Skull changes. 
he has a stormy relationship with an Italian perfume maker. He becomes involved in fighting the slave trade. He writes a remarkable treatise that predicts the development of a stock market that is completely detached from the real world. Once he returns to Sweden, the king shuts him up in, in a workshop. One simple task, make gold so as to arm a superpower. But Nordensko, he wants to make so much gold that the entire economic system collapses. Nordensko continues to deliver gold, more and more and more gold, up until the money markets have been closed. <coughs> economic systems collapse. And for a short time, there is so much gold that no one wants. If people use, use gold to seal pipes, uh, people, people use lumps of gold as doorstops. They, they mix it with gravel and, and make roads. It, it takes uh, several decades for the gold market to stabilize again. But by then, Nordensko has already moved to Sierra Leone, where he establishes an alternative society based on work rather than speculations pulled out of thin air. <laughs> so there you have it. Now get up and go out of the world and change it! There was no applause. <laughs> Sleeping guy was still asleep. The other thing. You could tell a mile away that she was spoiled. That she was the sort of person who had it easy ever since birth. You don't get hair that soft without conditioner, and you don't get skin that smooth without the best creams money can buy. That's not how things are for everyone. Some people never get to wash their hair in honey or own purses full of Parisian makeup. You could see that the fingernails that hadn't broken off were perfectly manicured, and presumably her teeth were white and beautiful, and I was just about to investigate. <laughs> I was leaning over the bed when the nurse came in, and I quickly backed up, and she gave me an odd look. I felt like I'd done something wrong. She said, are you okay? And I said, yes. The nurse walked around the room, and I didn't ask what would happen if someone accidentally unhooked the machine. <laughs> I didn't ask who would get her body if she died. But the nurse gave me an odd look, and then she left, and I felt like I didn't have much time. So I leaned over, stroked her arm, and called her my name, and then she opened her eyes and stared straight at me. The capital city. I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't have a plan. I, I should have done something drastic. Um, hijack a bus, start a demonstration, write a dissertation to unify everyone who is poor enough to survive but rich enough to be fooled into thinking that we ought to be satisfied. Uh, fire people up with a speech, burn cars, break shop windows, pretend that a just world is possible. But instead, I took the subway to Martina's job. I just wanted to see her. Uh, Hold her and convince her that everything would work out. But she wasn't there. Um, instead, there was this guy standing behind the counter. I, I took a walk. I bought a coffee at the bakery. But when I came back, the same guy was still there. So I stood outside the florist. Um, I thought she must be in the storeroom or on, on break. I stood there for quite a while, and I finished my coffee a long time ago. And it was just as finished as my career, I thought, I stood there a little while longer. Hey, where's your friend? What? Your friend. The guy who always used to stand there, the blonde guy with the guitar. I, I really don't know. When you see him, can you say hi for me and tell him I'm sorry? For what? Uh, I feel no what it's about. Just say I, uh, I overreacted a little bit. It was a, it was a misunderstanding. Tell him, tell him that for me. The guy with the little brother. I saved the money that he gave me. Uh, I took the subway home. 
a homeless guy was on the platform. He was missing his upper teeth. He was talking to himself and he smelled like pee. I walked by him quickly. He didn't look healthy. He had scabs on his face and dried blood in one ear. I walked to the other end of the platform. On my way home, I used money to buy a scratch-off ticket. I could feel that I would win. I, I, I knew that I would win. I was 100% sure that I would win. I didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> the other city. She looked at me and tried to say something, and I was right. Her teeth were white, almost as white as her cast and the sheets. And I gave her water, and she said, what's going on? And I realized she didn't recognize me, and I explained. I said, you were hit by a car. It was an accident. You walked straight out in front of a car. And she said, I don't remember anything. And I said, it was an accident. And she said, I have this feeling that someone pushed me. <laughs> have you called my brother? Please, can you call my brother? His number's on my phone. Peter, his name is Peter. Well, I had no idea how her phone worked, so I handed it to her and she dialed the number. And when he answered, she started to cry and the color returned to her face and I realized more and more that she would be okay. She wasn't alone. The nurse came back, and this time she had a guard with her. I realized it was time to leave. I left her purse on the chair. I motioned that I was going to get something to drink. She didn't notice when I left. She was talking to her brother, and I sneaked out, and I said hello to the guard, who told me to leave, and I walked toward the exit with the guard step behind me. I followed the exit signs. I left the hospital. I didn't take anything from her purse. I left it all there. All I took was the cash. And the next day I went back to work and I said, Now let's wipe the slate clean now let's wipe the slate clean. I know you tried to replace me. She's not here, and how can you depend on her if she doesn't even show up for her third day of work? <laughs> the capital city. It started with a few hours here and there. A quick way to make a little extra money. I called up one of Dad's old friends who owned his own business. Um, one day I removed broken tile in the kitchen, another day a uh, bathroom needed fixing up. And when I arrived there, I didn't quite understand because everything worked. The toilet flushed and the bathtub looked clean and new. And I asked if it was finished or if it was supposed to be renovated. And Dad's friend said renovated and he handed me a sledgehammer. We were paid cash uh, and I always brushed uh, sawdust out of my hair and cleaned my nails before I came home. I didn't have a guilty conscience because I, I didn't say anything to Martina. I wanted her to hold out hope. I just said that the selection process was moving slowly. My last job was outside of the city. A uh, roof needed to be replaced. In the stairwell, there were these small sculptures with nameplates, with famous names, and I thought Martina would have lived here if she had never met me in a building like this one, in a, in a quiet neighborhood with a playground in the courtyard and a roof terrace with a view that goes on for miles. I started in the attic. Um, I knocked out the wood and I brought it down while the others put up scaffolding and fetched safety lines. And when we took a break, I went up to the roof to drink my thermos of coffee and look at the view. You could see all the way downtown. Um, the metal was slick with dew and it smelled like a ship. We had to change the sails on a gigantic schooner. We were on our way away. When I finished with my coffee, I stood up and I took a step to the right and I took two steps back and suddenly the roof stopped existing. There was suddenly air where there should have been roof. My hands windmilled and no one had time to react. I was floating free. Under me was the hard asphalt and the pointy bike rack, and, and I wasn't afraid. I, did, I didn't feel dizzy somehow. I, I knew that I would be okay. There was so much time. I, I finished my dissertation. I, I became a professor. I fell. I, I went to international conferences, and I talked about Ben Houghton's theorem and Lorenzo's law. I fell. I celebrated Felicia's graduation. I visited Dad's grave. I fell. I, I thought I would never be like him, I fell. There was nothing to be afraid of. Time, time is infinite. I, the ground doesn't exist, do you hear me? 
the, the ground doesn't exist, don't worry. You, you don't need to be afraid, the ground doesn't exist. We're all gonna be okay. The ground, we all, all, all we have to do is hope, because the ground doesn't exist. 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 The ground. for a second will join us. Um, I'm having trouble seeing you, but hello. I'm Kate Lowald. Um, I'm the um, producer of the Play Company in New York, and um, it's my pleasure to be here with Jonas and Rachel and uh, Dan Rothenberg just to talk with you a little bit about the play. Um, and then also to um, leave a little bit of time for you to to ask some questions. Um, Jonas, I'd like to start, here's Dan. Welcome, Dan. Um, first of all, thank you for that wonderful reading. It's wonderful to hear the play. Um, Jonas, can you talk a little bit, I think the play premiered, was it last year in Stockholm? Um, would you talk just a little bit about um, what, what sparked the play for you and and also the reaction i think it's it brings up a lot for us um but i'd love to hear what started it for you yeah it actually it premiered in 2014 in stockholm at the royal dramatic theater in stockholm and um, the genesis of the play was actually a commission and i said in the audience thinking about that now but uh, they wanted me to write something about Frankenstein. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and now seeing it, you know, it's not, the monster is not really present in the text that you heard tonight. But I think that it started off with a commission surround, like I, I, re I reread uh, Shelley's Frankenstein and I came away with this fascination of, I think it started with this idea of, okay, what if we, create something and then lose power over it, kind of. Then it, at the same time, I had become a father, so I, I was in this mode of thinking a lot about money, um, thinking a lot about uh, just realizing that my, my personal relationship to money changed. Um, so in that, I think that the what we saw here, like the link between the texts that we heard tonight, and Frankenstein is this, um, yeah, a fascination with what numbers do to people, I think. Uh, and I was not at all interested in writing something that would bash capitalism, but rather see what happens when kind of numbers come in between people uh, and force them not to, yeah, numbers create friction, but also, in a sense, happiness and liberty. So this is, um, I think it would be too easy just to bash capitalism. It's very easy to see um, the negative aspects of capitalism, but it's also interesting to, to watch the allure of capitalism and the allure of money. Um, so I think that's how it started for me, and then, uh, then I uh, handed the play in, in um, in the spring of 2014. And then there was this kind of long silence when I got the feeling that the theater were kind of trying to find like breadcrumbs of 
Frankenstein in it. <laughs> um, but then they put it up and, and um, yeah, they, they just, uh, the final performance was just uh, like a few week, weeks ago in Stockholm. And, and uh, you were telling me before the reading that um, it had a very strong reaction. Can you can you tell me about that? Yeah, I, I think that um, I think it was. I think the reactions came a little bit from the fact that it was performed in a very very rich area of Stockholm, and I don't know New York enough to know the boundaries here. I know that I tried to impress Antje. Uh, last night, uh, because I said that I lived in Bushwick back in 2002, and I, I, I saw that you were, you were like, oh wow, Bushwick back then. And I, I, I realized from your reaction that maybe that was not a great idea when I, <laughs> uh, but I, I don't know the, like how the, uh, I don't really understand how the areas here are linked to prosperity, but in Stockholm I see that very clearly, like how, um, economic possibilities kind of create very, very uh, clear boundaries between different areas. So the play was performed in a very rich area, in a very, um, with an audience who are not thinking a lot about money, because that's what happens when you don't, when you have a lot of money, money becomes like air, you don't think about the fact that you have it. So I love the, the, the intermission speaker when he says, you know, we've all been poor, right? <laughs> and in that room, people are just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been poor, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I don't mean, you know, giving up your third car poor, people are just, okay. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting to see that, and um, a lot of things that I thought were just, no, you know, this is how we all think, in that room, created a lot of weird weirdness. We always have walkouts, <coughs> always, yeah. In the intermission, there's always one or two. Uh, that's a, speci a specific scene that creates a lot of reactions. Um, <coughs> also, what is the word, like, in reactions, both like protests, in the intermission when he p p takes the guy and puts him in the water. Uh, but at one point they, they started grabbing, like shouting to the intermission speaker, you know, stop it, stop it, don't do it. <laughs> and then there was someone who started, like a fundraiser to be able to pay for the guy who was putting, <laughs> you know, they were like, okay, so uh, everyone chip in, you know, and they started giving, they wanted to give him money in order not to do, you know, it, everyone on stage know, and everyone in that room know that we are taking part in, in fiction. But there's something with that. Um, I thought it was interesting that the, the response was kind of trying to bribe him or like trying to use money in order to, for him not to do this, this act towards uh, Peter, the character. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was looking online today at pictures from the production in uh, Stockholm and then also uh, it was produced in Germany recently. And um, from the pictures, I don't know how accurate this is, but in Stockholm, the, pic the show um, had sort of bright colors and a lot of Baroque, in some scenes, Baroque scenery and costumes and gold statues everywhere. It looked almost whimsical in a lot of ways. And then in Germany, it was very stark and sort of industrial feeling. It was just very, very, very different. And, um, so I was thinking, your plays are produced all over the world and um, obviously speak to people all over the world because people want to produce them. And f from what I know of your plays, you have very little stage directions. Um, so I think directors have quite a bit of liberty in terms of how they stage your plays and you've seen them <coughs> staged many different ways, I'm sure. Um, so I'd love to hear what's important to you if you think about that when you write and what's important to you about how your plays are staged? Well, I don't, I'm a very non-visual person. I, I, I'm not really, um, so in my family, I have, I have a brother who's an actor. So in my family, we ended, like I became the book nerd. And so I, I've always been into literature and writing and. And I'm also a novelist, so I spend time writing books and then uh, 
take time off to write poetry because I enjoy it so much. But um, so I don't have an image of what it would be like. I remember with my first play that we worked on Invasion, I remember the director coming to me and saying, so what do you visualize for this play? And I said, <laughs> I think I had a suggestion which was just, maybe we could just do, do like a dark stage and no actors, just voices. <laughs> And I remember saying, yeah, I remember her saying, like, no, but it's not. Then it becomes a radio play. And I was just like, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe that's a good idea. Because in my head, I don't see it. I'm, you know, I'm very happy to see it now. But in my, my imagination works, is very voice driven. So what I mainly do, I give a lot of liberty to the directors. And then what I do when I uh, attend rehearsals, is more, my, all my notes are just like um, notes on tone I guess you know well actually she's lying when she says that he's trying to make a joke that doesn't work here um, so I rarely and I haven't seen the Berlin production yet but um, from the images they look very very different uh, and I think that's that's the beauty of it when I, I love when I when directors are kind of not too cuddly with my texts if that makes sense well, when they text take the text and also uh, yeah, I'm not to kind of kidnap it in a sense, and, and, and um, it's quite similar to what Rachel is doing when she's translating me. Actually, uh, kind of re recreating something rather than um, imitating. Um, yeah, but there, I've also been to versions of my plays when I've just been like not really, especially in Germany, actually, where I've not really realized that it was my play. Kind of <laughs> Um, because they, they've taken so much liberties, and I'm just like, I didn't write a fruit fight. You know, why are they throwing fruit? fruit? Uh, or like quoting law. In one instance, it was a long, uh, like a long uh, quotation of Schiller in my play that I hadn't written that they had put in there. Um, then I just like sneak, sn snuck out. <laughs> um, but um, uh, but I think. That's also why, the, the, to me, that's the amazing thing with theatre, that there is this, you create a space in a room where, where, uh, where those kind of things can happen. Um, okay, yeah. All right, so we're short on time, so I will open it up. No, maybe we don't, maybe you ask the Dan and the Oh, okay, mm -hmm. all right, yeah, sure. Be, yes. yeah. I'm prepared for that. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Well, speaking of Rachel, uh, I wanted to ask you, Rachel, um, we met first when we commissioned you to translate uh, Jonas's play Invasion, and you've been translating them ever since, books, everything. Um, so you're kind of <coughs> our bridge to Jonas, and um, language is so very, very important to his work. Um, I just wanted to ask you, maybe talk about this play, um, what you were thinking about when you translated it, and what's important. Sure. Um, so I read it the first time, not long after you wrote it, I think, and at the time I was a graduate student, <laughs> so I had one relationship to money, and then I didn't translate it until just a few months ago, uh, and life has changed. I finished graduate school, got married, thinking about buying a house, <laughs> completely different relationship to money. So I think a lot of a lot of what I was thinking when I was working on it was just kind of the shame <laughs> of, of like recognizing myself and, and your characters. And I know that, that that you you write such good characters that you see parts of yourself in so many of them, but it's always a little bit like uncomfortable realization that, oh yeah, that seems familiar. And I, I think this one is actually one of the most straightforward text linguistically that I've translated of Jonas's. Um, the first thing I translated of Jonas's was his novel Montefiore's second novel, and that one was amazingly tricky and so much fun. <laughs> and I can just say that, that um, it's a real gift as a translator to work with an author who will let you mess with what they're doing. That's I appreciate that so much about working with Jonas. Do you find, um not only just thinking specifically about the language, but any, um, I mean, I guess especially thinking about money, and um, I don't really know what 
the financial culture is in Sweden, but did you think about translating that in any way, or did you find it very straightforward? And um, I, I thought about it in the sense of, one thing I'm interested in a lot when I translate is like cultural references that are very different in Sweden and in the US. And I find in a play you have to consider them differently than in a book because the audience has this very immediate, like you, you kind of need to know right then, you don't have time to think what might this word mean, you just need to go with the flow. And, and that came up a lot when we were working with Invasion as well. So I just, I, I tried to make sure that like all the references about that $10 that's a movie ticket and, and it, like have the Metro pass or whatever, I just tried to make them kind of match up um, here so they didn't sound completely out of the ordinary. I think they matched up pretty well in the first place, but there was some like looking a lot of stuff up and making sure. Okay, one, one more. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> I know, um, Dan. <laughs> um, so I know you had sort of barely a few hours to work on this play, but um, you work on so many different kinds of, of plays and, and theater with your company, Pig Iron. Uh, you've directed Japanese plays with us. You just do a wide variety of work, Shakespeare. And I was thinking, listening to the play tonight, that this play just covers a pretty wide canvas. Um, what, what were you working on with the actors when you approached rehearsals today? So much of Jonas's work is uh, similar to this Japanese playwright we worked on together, Toshiki Okada. There's a lot of talking to the audience and description. I guess now that I've met you, pulling from your novelist's point of view. Um, so something my company cares about a lot. I work with this company, Pig Iron in Philadelphia. Is contact with the audience. We actually did performance research on contact with the audience. It's very hard in a reading situation but I cast actors that I know are pretty great at that, and I was mostly working with them on uh, just, talking, just talking to people, basically. And, and, and the notes that I had time to give had to do with like that, that feeling of complicity, which I think is very important in what you've written around money, which is especially um, and Andre's character saying, you know how it is. Mm -hmm. You know how it is about, oh, I'll never, I'll never buy something like that. You know, my notes were a little bit about like, but share with the audience that uh, you too would, if you had $300,000, you too would do that. Um, so that was something that I, that I worked on a little bit. All right. Talk, Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank you.